Hello again. Okay. Um, let's jump right back in. We were talking about libertarianism and the problems with libertarianism, and this might lead us to consider a compatibilist view, right? Perhaps we don't have to, so what's compatibilism? Well, look, perhaps we don't have to reject determinism after all. Perhaps Leibniz is right. The world is completely determined. Um, perhaps we don't want to describe it quite the way Leibniz does, but he was onto something. In other words, maybe we can hold on to the idea that human actions are predictable and that they are governed by laws of psychology and physics, while still making room for freedom and responsibility. Right? Perhaps, so where's the problem? Perhaps the problem was, was in the idea that we had about what freedom means, or the, the concept of freedom that we are operating with. Maybe we have to rethink uh, how we define freedom or what we mean by freedom. Right? Freedom doesn't have to mean that an action is uncaused. We already talked about that, because that just leads to random action for which we're not responsible. Um, it also doesn't have to mean, as the libertarian thinks, that, um, that, uh, that, that free action has a special cause. Right? Um, freedom can mean that an action, um, you know, some of our actions have, have a no normal types of causes, but what, what makes them free is that that cause is operating in, in a different way or in the right way, as Sider puts it, right? So um, freedom means a free action is one in which um, the cause operates in the right way, right? But the, the cause is a normal cause, but it's operating in a different way <clears throat> um, or in the right way. All right, so what does that mean? What does it mean to say um, that my action is caused in the right way? Well, here's a few options he considers. One, that a free action is one that is caused by the agent's beliefs and desires, right? not by someone else's beliefs and desires, or not by something that's not a belief or a desire, right? So this contrasts with actions that are caused by someone else's beliefs and desires. It also contrasts with actions that are caused by external events, right? Like where like a rock falls on me uh, and something happens to me. Whatever happens to me was not free because it wasn't caused by my beliefs and desires. It was caused by something else. Right, um, or random psychological states. Right, so sometimes I can act as a result of like a some pops into my head, but it wasn't my action wasn't based on a belief and a desire, which is based on some random psychological event. Okay, that we wouldn't call that a free action. Right, so this ties into rationality and responsibility in the right sort of way. The problem case Cider considers is the, 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 the hypnosis. Right, suppose someone hypnotizes me and puts beliefs and desires into my my my, my mind. Right, but uh, wouldn't some wouldn't say that someone who was acting from those beliefs and desires was acting freely because I'm I'm under hypnosis, so that's a problem. Uh, so we can revise the theory. So two is a kind of revision of the theory to deal with the hypnosis problem. Suppose we define a free action as one that is caused by the the person's beliefs and desires, provided the person was not compelled by another person to have those beliefs and desires. Okay, so that takes care of the hypnosis example. But here, the, the issue is that this seems like a circular definition, because contained within the definition of free action is a reference to not being compelled. But the only way to explain what it means, what that means, is by uh, using the word freedom, right? Uh, not being compelled is another way of saying uh, uh, not being, uh, um, um, you know, of, 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 of being free, okay? So it, it seems like a circular definition. A free action is one that is caused by the person's beliefs and desires, provided the person um, um, was not compelled by another person. That seems to contain a circular uh, reference. Um, okay, so even if we can get around the circularity problem though, there's a different issue that comes up here. It's one thing to say that I wasn't compelled by another person to have the beliefs and desires that I have. It's quite another to say that I chose my beliefs and desires, or that I choose what to believe and what to desire. Um, so the question is, what does free action require? Does it require just that I do something because I want to do it, or that I act on a desire that I chose to have? And what if I just happen to have the desires that I have, and I didn't in any sense choose to have that desire? Am I still free? Right? So now I act on the desire, right? I, I act on the desire that I have, but I didn't choose to have that desire. Do we, will, do we still want to say that I acted freely? Right? That's sort of an interesting question. Right? Well, in this case, nobody compelled me to have this desire. Right? Let's say it's like a desire for ice cream. Okay, Nobody compelled me to have the desire for ice cream. 
it came from me, but it didn't come from my choice. It's just something I was given, something I was hardwired to desire. So in what sense? So I didn't choose that desire. So am I really acting freely when I act on desires that I didn't choose to have? That's a sort of more interesting problem. Um, is, is not being compelled by another person to desire something enough to show that I'm acting freely? Do I also have to show that I chose to have that desire? And if so, it seems like many of our actions are not free because in many cases I don't choose what to desire. Okay. Um, so the final suggestion that he, that he considers to get around this circularity problem where the definition of free action does not make reference to, to a concept that involves the idea of freedom um, is here. A free action is one that is caused by the person's beliefs and desires, provided those beliefs and desires flow from who the person is. Okay, so this is not a circular definition. We don't have within the definition a reference to something that involves the idea of freedom, right? We have this idea that a free action is one not only caused by beliefs and desires, but ones that flow from who, who I am, one that, ones that flow from my character, right? Ones that are characteristic of me. Okay, that's an interesting account. It raises a question of, you know, what is my character, right? And what does it mean for some of my beliefs and desires to flow from my character while others maybe are uncharacteristic? How do we make that distinction, right? This is sort of the question. How do we draw the distinction between who the person really is and who she or others think she is, right? Or how do we determine what the authentic self is? Um, ultimately, it seems like this uh, definition of free action, the compatibilist definition of free action, depends on some thicker conception of uh, the authentic self or some, some strong uh, conception of like what makes me the person that I am. Um, and it's not clear that we have that, um, or it's not clear that we can give an explanation of that in a clear way. Okay, so, but this idea of the authentic self leads into uh, Descartes, which I had you read for today. It's a nice segue or pivot to Descartes, right? Because that's Descartes' central question. What am I? How do I know that I exist? How do I know what I am? What is my true nature? How do I know that I'm free, for example? I mean, these are questions that are at the center of Descartes' meditations. Right? He begins with doubt, right? How can I know anything? Is there anything that I can know for certain? But a central question of the second meditation is what am I? Right? And how do I know what I am? How do I know that I exist? Uh, what is my true nature and how do I know that? Okay, so that's the basic question of the meditations. That's the task of the book. There, there's many things that he's trying to understand, but one, central question is, what am I? Um, and the idea that he forms of himself, turns out, is bound up with the idea of a will. We haven't really talked about this idea of a will and its connection to freedom, right? But they're clearly connected. And this is at the heart of Descartes' sort of analysis of what he is, or investigation or meditation on what he is and how, how he knows what he is. Well, I am a being that has a will, right? The idea of myself is bound up with the idea of, of having a will. And he develops that in the fourth meditation which we haven't read. But in the first meditation, we see the idea of the will emerging. So here's a quote from page two and three in, in, the, in the file that I sent you, the PDF file that I sent you. This is toward the end of the first meditation. So quoting Descartes, so in future, if I want to discover any certainty, I must withhold my assent from these former beliefs just as carefully as I withhold it from obvious falsehoods. It isn't enough merely to have noticed this though. I must make an effort to remember it. Okay, so here he's just reached the main conclusion of the first meditation, namely that all of his beliefs can be called into doubt, that none of his former beliefs are immune to doubt. And as he puts it, this is the result of rational argument, right? He's, he's led to this conclusion through argument. Reason leads him there. It's not the play of his imagination. He's not just playing around. Reason has led him to this conclusion that everything can be called into doubt. But this discovery gives rise to an act of will. Right? It is easy to forget that the arguments that he has made give him reason to doubt all of his beliefs. That's easy to forget that. It's easy to go back to your habits of believing what you used to believe. So he has to remind himself, right? He has to make an effort to withhold assent or suspend judgment until he can prove that at least one of his beliefs can be known with certainty. And that's an act of will. Okay? In my notes, I go on to develop another idea uh, about the will in Descartes, but I'll leave it there and you can read those notes on your own. I hope this helps you think about free will and determinism and shift to thought about Descartes and his search for self-knowledge, his search for certainty, which leads to self-knowledge and also leads to his knowledge of God, right? He will prove that God exists in the third meditation. 
after he proves that he exists or I exist in the second meditation. Okay, we'll talk about that more later. Have a good night. Okay, take care.